Ladies and gentlemen, this is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoints Knuckleheads of Liberty podcast. You've heard their point, now listen to the counterpoint. Welcome to the Knuckleheads of Liberty podcast. Uh, we have a little bit of a different show to, for you today. Uh, we're going to do an interview today with Brian Brady. He is a founder of the Republican Liberty Caucus of San Diego. Uh, and so uh, he's had uh, some interesting experiences in campaigning. And so we're going to talk to him about that. But before we do, let me introduce you to our panel. In our upper right-hand corner, we have Leon, the word Brathwaite, last word in Liberty. He is a retired engineer in the state of California. And in our lower right-hand corner, we have our screaming eagle of freedom, Tim Ever. He is a pilot in the state of California. And in my upper left-hand corner, we have our guest today, and that's Brian Brady. And my name is Jason McPhee, and I will be your host today. Uh, so let's uh, jump right into it. So, uh, Brian, I guess you've had some interesting experiences uh, with uh, politics and liberty. And we kind of like to interview people when, you know, at these local levels when we can find out more about them, because this is kind of how maybe other people can can learn from your experience and, and uh, you know, use that to promote liberty locally in their area as well. And so I, I know uh, I, you had some uh, uh, experience uh, with uh, um, working on the Ron Paul's campaign back when he ran for president. Uh, but why don't you give us a little bit, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and, um, you know, uh, how you came into uh, this, this uh, politics of liberty. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, I've always been involved in politics since I was 18 uh, on the right side of the aisle. Um, a funny story. I grew up in Cherry Hill, New Jersey and registering to vote the mayor of our little township when I went down to Township Hall to vote, came out and she was a friend of our family and said, oh, Brian, you're registering as a Republican. You're Irish Catholic. You know, your grandfather is turning over in his grave. <laughs> and it was at that moment that I wasn't quite sure I was a Republican. I just figured that was the party I, I mostly identified with. But I knew right then and there that Democrats would never look at me as a human being. They'd always look at me as an interest group and therefore yes. a voting block. And yeah. uh, uh, so just it's interesting. That little pivotal moment just was really important for me in terms of, uh, you know, dignity, respect and rights of the individual. And as I went on to college, I had some pretty good professors who uh, identified that in me. And when I was talking in class and encouraged me to do things like read Barry Goldwater's Conscience of a Conservative Um and as I was involved in uh, a couple of states, both in uh, New Jersey and then Ar and the Arizona, when I moved to San Diego, I, I stopped getting involved in politics, which was good. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I, I had time off and uh, had led a normal life. But uh, when the whole Tea Party thing was kind of brewing and, and Ron Paul was, was talking about ending the wars and ending the Federal Reserve Bank and... Uh, you know, reducing rather than reforming government. Uh, he was strumming all the right chords for, for my brain. Um, I don't know if you remember back in 2008, we also had the, uh, we also had Prop 8 in California where uh, they wanted to make a constitutional amendment uh, forbidding uh, same-sex marriage. Mm. And uh, I just thought that was a really bad idea for the government to have that awesome responsibility of defining who should or shouldn't be married. I thought it was best left to churches and Vegas chapels and drive through whatever, you know, I just thought that the institution of marriage was so great that it should be defined on a level uh, away from government. So, uh, uh, you know, when I was 18, I, I pretty much hated the Soviet, Soviet Union and hated the federal government as Reagan told me to. And uh, <laughs> that, that stuck with me uh, throughout the years. And so, you know, when Ron Paul said, hey, by the way, you really should hate what the federal government's doing. Finally, for the first time in, in, in some 20 years, someone was was uh, was speaking my language. So uh, I got involved locally and uh, uh, started going to local Ron Paul meetups in 2010. And uh, we had a great guy in San Diego. He passed away. He was the chairman of the Libertarian Party, a guy named Michael Benoit, who realized that you know, Ron was doing this through the Republican Party, and I knew Republicans, and I was involved in the local Republican Party. 
So he said, why don't you be the chairman of the uh, local campaign? And uh, I said, oh, great. That sounds wonderful. Everyone's going to call me chairman. And, and it turned out just to be a really hard job. <laughs> so, Brian, what is what is the uh, Republican Liberty Caucus? I've never heard of them, to be honest. Um, um, what are they? Are they are part of the Republican Party, but just with with libertarian leanings, or what? What exactly is that? Uh, yes. So you you've defined it perfectly. Way back when Ron Paul left Congress back in 1988, he established the Republican Liberty Caucus, and the idea was to attract libertarians, constitutional conservatives, uh, and generally those of us that believe the federal government should be reduced rather than, than reformed. And uh, by doing that, he, he kind of sprung a nationwide movement, which is recognized by the Republican Party. And uh, every state's got a Republican Liberty Caucus, and many counties within the states uh, have a Republican Liberty Caucus that you know works within the Republican Party to advance the principles of liberty. That's the definition of it. That's, that's, that's really interesting. You know, I was really struck by a story when that uh, when the, the mayor told you that, uh, oh God, why you vote? Why are you going to be a Republican? You know, even now at age 65, I still get that, that, that reason, not for your reason, of course, it's because right. I'm black. Oh, I thought it's because you had a beard, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That too. <laughs> yeah, that too, that too. Yeah, but because I'm black and immigrant, everybody thinks I'm supposed to be some guy of the left. But um, I, I get, I, even to this day, people still, how could you be somebody on the right? How could you be a conservative? How could you be a libertarian? You know, it's... it's how it's dare so you hard, think? You know? How so dare hard. you think, right? I mean, how dare you have an opinion and think? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, yeah. and that's very tragic. I, I mean, I think that's extremely tragic because, like I said, and I, I, I was careful to say the dignity of the individual... Sure. I, grew, I grew up and I am a practicing Catholic, so that matters to me. So when we talk about the dignity of the individual, we must talk about the dignity of your mind as well as your skin color and your and your yeah. everything, uh, uh, because uh, we, that's very important. And oh, indeed, indeed. Uh, and certainly, an Irish Catholic and a black man can vote different ways than than what they tell us to do. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. As far as I'm concerned, if I'm, as long as we are thinking for ourselves, we can vote for whoever we choose. That's how, that's how I feel. I agree. So, Amen. Yes. Pilots get a pass on all that because we're just the black sheep and no one expects anything but terrible stuff from us <laughs> and usually get it. As long as you're there at the beginning and the end, doesn't matter about the middle. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there was a couple of things I wanted to um, uh, touch on that you mentioned uh, earlier. And you said that uh, when you went to college, uh, I guess a professor gave you uh, conservative material to read. How far back is this? That because was... this doesn't resemble college at all today. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that, yes. Well, yes. That guy's retired. Or else, or else <laughs> sure. they killed him. Uh, so I, I actually happened in high school. Now that I'm thinking about it, I had a, uh, I went to a Jesuit high school and I had a, uh, a teacher, a history teacher who kind of heard me talking in class. And he's the one who actually said to me, you might want to try this conscience of a conservative because you're really out there, kid. Uh, <laughs> and so I did that. But when I went, when I went to Villanova, I had a, uh, I had a couple of professors, um, one of which, uh, has passed away now. Uh, Dr. Staley was talk. He was very encouraged of. Uh, he encouraged us to read to to read Hayek, and uh, I did. And uh, you know, that, and he he's the one who said, "Hey, try this Ayn Rand," and and I did. Yeah. And you know, all the lights went off, and uh, he really developed that. Um, I, I'm I'm hopeful. I have a daughter in college right now, and uh, she has a, a professor who's actually the mayor of Coronado, California. Uh, she, whom, whom, whom we both knew before she went to college there, but he threw out the textbook and he taught everything from material from the foundation for economic education. No. So I was like stunned that really? he was able to get away with this and teach them stuff yes. from fee. Yeah. But, uh, I was thrilled and I was thrilled that, uh, he's still teaching there. And, uh, huh. 
Uh, and I think it's because he's uh, so successful in engaging with students that uh, that they keep him around. So uh, there's a little bit of hope. Well, well you know, critical, critical thinking is a rare bird. It's a rare bird these days on, on college campuses. So I am very encouraged to hear that is ongoing, you know, with your, with your daughter and with that, with that college, wherever it is, that, um, where that is happening. It is. It's the University of San Diego, not to be confused with San Diego State. It's oh, the okay. University of San Diego. Got you. Got mm -hmm. you. Okay. Well, that, that's, that's great news. But, uh, you know, there was a, a getting to your campaign work that you did with uh, Ron Paul. So which one was it? Was it when he ran as a libertarian or when he ran as a, well, a Republican? The, the second time he ran as okay. a Republican in 2012. And so uh, that was interesting because I learned – uh, something about campaigning, and this has been helpful for me as I talk to local candidates, and that is you're on your own, right? I mean, we got no support from the national, not even emails. They take weeks to respond to us. And I'd go, well, how am I going to get yard signs? Because I was, I had worked within the local Republican Party, so I kind of knew the blueprint. You know, you put yard signs up, you try to bang on doors, you try to turn out the vote. And to do that, you had to raise money. And so uh, I had to find a way to raise money, not into the national campaign, but into the local campaign, which is why we started the Republican Liberty Caucus of San Diego County, because it was, um, I think it's a 527 organization where we could raise money, unlimited amounts of money and spend unlimited amounts of money because we're an independent committee, an independent expenditure committee. So, I mean, to do what we wanted to do, we had to go around and raise money and you know, we raised about over the course of six months, we raised a little bit over $10,000 to buy yard signs from the national campaign and, and kind of fund the things we wanted to do. And we did voter registration on the boardwalk in Pacific Beach, uh, which was really a lot of fun. Uh, we decided that there were five congressional districts in San Diego County, and we weren't going to win them all. So we targeted the one of five, which we thought would be the best. And we, we, I was fortunate to have some local political consultants when I called them up and said, Hey, by the way, I need some help. And I know you're not really a Ron Paul guy, but, and I need to not, you need to do it for no money. And, uh, they did, and were really helpful in helping us identify that. And so we had about 150 volunteers. Um, we registered, uh, when Ron Paul came to San Diego, we registered 700 new Republicans on the spot. So the local Republican Party just, you know, they loved us, so they didn't care. Um, but we, uh, we doubled the percentage vote between 2008 and 2012 in San Diego County. So, you know, hmm. we took them from 6% to 12%. Not necessarily a victory, but as you all know, if you work in the Liberty Movement, oh, yeah. you, you, hmm. you, you measure in yards, not touchdowns. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, that's uh, uh, kind of interesting, uh, you know, what you had to say. I, I, and I know uh, when 2012, Ron Paul actually came down here, not uh, to Sacramento, I don't think, but uh, uh, to Davis, which is nearby. And I kicked myself because I wasn't able to make it to that. And I heard that he drew like three or 4,000 people to the to a, a fairly left-leaning university here in California. So that's, uh, uh, you know, really speaks to the idea that, you know, maybe there's a lot of people who are really open to liberty, you know, even if it's, uh, you know, uh, even, even if it's Republicans, uh, you know, who are voicing that liberty. So, so, so he, what he did back then was he was going to the college campuses. He went to university of California, San Diego, yep. not to be confused with my daughter's school. And then he went to UCLA and then he went to UC Davis. And I think he went to another one and it, it, he was a rock star. And, you know, I always joke around the poor man, he, he would talk like Cuba, you know, he, he would just never like Castro, he would never shut up, you know, he'd go on and on and on and, and give hour and 10 minute speeches. And, uh, but, you know, he'd drive four, he'd draw four or 5,000 people. And uh, we went to the one at UCLA. And of course, we went to the one at UCSD. And it was literally like being at a rock concert. And those, yeah, I, I was there too at San yeah. Diego. Yeah, oh, yeah, it was awesome. Maybe. And those and the kids and the uh, like the kids the young people who worked involved in uh, um, the students for liberty and the uh, young Americans for liberty they did an amazing job both inviting him and staging uh, the affair. Mm -hmm. Wow! Yeah. Yes, so Brian, do. Brian, do you consider yourself a Republican with libertarian leanings or a libertarian 
with involvement with the Republicans. Yeah. I, so I'm, I'm like the only conservative in a room full of libertarians and the only libertarian in a room full of conservatives, which is difficult, right? Bunch yes. of libertarians are together. They're screaming to defund the police. And I'm like, that's not such a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Bunch of conservatives in the room and, are, yeah. and they're screaming, we got to outlaw gay marriage. And I'm like, that's not such a good idea either. So <laughs> I don't, uh, uh, but I, but I am a Republican. I've been a registered Republican since I was 18. I've okay. worked within the Republican Party. Uh, I've I've turned my back on neoconservative candidates, and I've done all that I could to find the Rand Pauls, the te- you know the next Rand Paul, Ted Cruz, the next uh, uh, Ron Justin. DeSantis. I'm looking for Justin Just, Justin Amash, Justin Amash, looking to get those guys elected within the Republican apparatus. We've been. I'm going to bring his name up again because I'm hopeful that lots of people are watching this. Uh, the professor to whom I referenced earlier and the mayor of Coronado is a young man named Richard Bailey. He is yeah. exactly in our wheelhouse and he's going to run for Congress. He's the kind of guy we want to get elected. Uh, I don't know that he's the next Justin Amash, but I know he's the next Rand Paul type. And the more people we get like that in Congress, the more time we're we're, we're going to not only be able to stop the tide, but maybe turn it back and do things like have a conversation about auditing the Federal Reserve or abolishing the Department of Education. And yes. if we get people like that in there, we'll have some we'll have some traction. <laughs> Fair enough. Awesome. Fair enough. Yeah, but Brian, so uh, in, in working closely with uh, other Republicans, and I guess do you find you get a lot of static in the Republican Party and trying to push candidates like Ron Paul and Justin Amash. Is there is there a lot of pushback or is there a lot of acceptance? Is there, does it seem like Republicans are hungry for that kind of a candidate? So uh, in the beginning, in 2012 and 13, there was a lot of pushback. Uh, I, I knew my local Congress members pretty well. Uh, my congressman was Brian Bilbray, uh, who since retired, and then Daryl Issa. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, we've had nothing but great experiences with them. So I'll give you an example. Daryl Issa said to me one time, he goes, gosh, Ron Paul. He goes, I love Ron Paul. I'm like, well, you could have told me. It'd be nice if you sponsored a bill or two with him every now and then. And he goes, look, if the Republican Party, if we had 205 Ron Pauls in Congress, it would be great. We'd look at Article 1, Section 8, say, sorry, can't do it. And, and, and we wouldn't do it. He goes, one Ron Paul is awesome because we all do what we got to do to vote. And he's the guy out there reminding us. He goes, but when we get 30 Ron Pauls, we can't get anything done. He goes, so if you can't get me 200 Ron Pauls, I'm having, uh, it's hard. Uh, but we've had, you know, real good luck with these, these members of Congress. Uh, I remember calling Daryl Issa's office when Ron Paul was doing the audit, the Fed bill. And uh, I, I knew the local people there very well and said, I, I really need Congressman Issa to, to uh, co-sponsor this. And I'm sure it wasn't just me, but... They knew who I was, and sure enough, he signed on as a co-sponsor. Uh, again, I don't know that it's me doing that, but if there were, you know, 600 of me in the country in, 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 in 200 or 300 congressional districts, we might just get the ball down the field a little farther. Hmm. You yeah. know, while I'm thinking of it, uh, and Brian will give, give us uh, the link to this candidate, this young guy that's running mm-hmm. for Congress so that we can... Uh, post that as a link uh, in the Facebook po- uh, page or the post for uh, this particular podcast so that if anyone's interested, they'll see it there and they can follow it uh, to uh, support that guy. Great. Thank you. Yeah. What is the guy's name? What did you say his name was? Richard Bailey, B-A-I-L-E-Y. And he is the mayor. He is the 51st mayor of Coronado, California, the okay. birthplace of naval aviation. Very good. <laughs> and he, he, I assume, is a libertarian running as a Republican. Is that correct? He, he is a Republican. Uh, uh, I don't know that I'd call him a libertarian, but I don't know that I'd call him a conservative. He is okay. a small government Republican. Uh, oh, yeah. okay. If we have time, I'll tell you a funny story about him. When he first got elected to city council at the age of 24, he, he said to me, uh, hey, I, I, you know, they only want, they don't want to grant a liquor license to the Walgreens, the Walgreens are in town. I, they only want one or two li- uh, 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 liquor stores there. <laughs> By the way, this young man doesn't drink, right? 
And mm-hmm. he says, but that's not right. Right. That, that violates all the tenets of competition. And I said, yeah, he goes, so I'm, I'm, he goes, and they're all Republic, mostly Republicans in Coronado. How do I get this idea across at the council meeting? And so I said, well, you know, tell them you're going to tell me you want to try to cure childhood cancer, skin cancer. And he looks at me puzzlingly and I said, you know, if the other if the other liquor stores in town, there'll be competition. Maybe you could buy a, a bottle of wine for a dollar less every week. And you take that dollar and you buy some sunscreen and you go down to the local s- school and you drop off the sunscreen as a donation. In 20 years, there'll be no more childhood skin care. The kids will all grow up. There'll be no skin cancer because they all wore skin block. And he goes, no, he didn't use that, but it got his mind thinking and this is the kind of things he was saying in those tough votes where you, you and I would look at him and be like, you guys are Republicans, allegedly conservatives. Why would you vote for rent seekers? Yes. And it's because the council members, you know, I always say these council members are nice people. They're, they're the local insurance agent, the local attorney, but they don't know. And so they, they do dumb votes and uh, you got to pull them aside and say, you know, one liquor store in town is fascism, right? You know, one yeah. doctor in town is fascism. Like, we don't want that. We want competition. Uh, but fortunately, he's been he's been very good at articulating liberty principles very well. Okay. All okay. Right. Fair enough. Fair enough. <clears throat> it's, it's I mean, the, I mean, the, the 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 main thing is the articulation of the principles rather than what label we put on the person as to whether they're Republican or a Libertarian or whatever. Okay. It's the principles, the articulation of those principles that is so mightily important. Indeed. You know, we have a, uh, a, a government, a quasi government unelected agency called SANDAG, the San Diego Association of Governments, which is a pass through agency for all the transportation money. And, you know, Richard got himself on that board because he was the mayor of Cornell and he was allowed to appoint someone from his council. So he appointed himself and he got on there in the first meeting. He said, you know, we got to audit this thing as quickly as possible because we're, 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 we we're blowing money and maybe we should just like vote to end it. And I was like in the back room going, listening to the thing online going, did he just call for the abolition of Sandag? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he's he's been uh, uh, he's been good about uh, he's been good about going out there and uh, and articulating things that, that frankly no other politicians at least in California would do. No good, good. All good. right. Good. Well, you know, I, I, I guess one of the most important things too we like to lead people with in some of these interviews is, is what do you think is one of the biggest takeaways you've had from from trying to work locally in, in politics and to be able to push messages of liberty. I, I guess uh, what, what's the biggest thing you'd like to leave somebody else with who's trying to figure this out? Well, if you're going to work with local people that want to run for office, um, I always say that there's three types of people, right? There's serious people. There is serious people that want to win, right? And there's vanity candidates. So we stay away from vanity candidates because, you know, they're, they're just, they're narcissists, which is pretty much all of them. But you, you, but if you find someone who's serious who wants to win, you have to explain to them the importance of money in campaigning. And we all hate this idea, but that's reality. And so you have to also explain to them how important it is to be really dedicated to it. Right? You can't run for Congress, at least in California, if you don't quit your job and work full time in a campaign. Like, if you don't have the ability to do that, don't even try to run for Congress because you won't win. And you've got to raise a bunch of money. But if once you get over this fantasy of running for Congress and we say, listen, you can run for the water board and still work at your full-time job. And by the way, we've, we've done this with, some, with about a half dozen candidates. You can hold the line on rate payer increases, develop a reputation, and then you can move up <clears throat> to a county supervisor. And then you can move up to Congress one day. So I, I, I think the, the biggest thing is also when, when people are recruited to run is to say to them and be real, realistic with them so that they understand that if they can't win, they're just placeholder candidates. And that's why people aren't giving them money, right? If they're in a district, they can't win. So I think the biggest thing I'd say is talking to candidates and, and speaking to them realistically about what their motivation is. If they're just out there trying to get the message so they can get on local TV, bravo. They have no chance to win, great. 
We know we're going to get them on local TV because they'll be a major party candidate, and then they can talk about the principles we want to talk about. But if they're serious about w winning, money and time, and uh, it's it's going to be hard 12-hour days to win something like an assembly, state senate, or congressional seat. Hmm. Well, uh, looks like uh, we're just about uh, to the end of the show, and a lot of times we uh, break into our knucklehead noise patrol now. And actually, we have one that's sort of related a little bit to, to San Diego, so I will bring this one up. And it has to do with the border crisis that uh, uh, that we have right now, and uh, all the issues that we've been having with, uh, yeah, you know, I guess uh, being able to. Uh, have sort of a controlled system, if nothing else, <laughs> down there. And so Kamala Harris, since uh, Biden's come into office, has uh, said she's been going going to go down and visit the border, and I, as if that will solve the problem. Uh, but anyways, in a, a recent interview with Lester Holt, uh, Holt she said, uh, at some point, uh, you know we are going to the border. We've been to the border. So this whole thing about the border, we've been to the border. We've been to the border. So Holt then asked her, you haven't been to the border. <laughs> and then she said, and I haven't been to Europe. And I mean, <laughs> I don't understand the point you're making. <laughs> I'm not discounting the importance of the border. So I'm not sure if Kamal is angling for a trip to Europe or <laughs> must be. she just doesn't understand the issue. No, taxpayer, it must be tax taxpayer paid, you know. That's what she's asking for. You see yeah. with, Ka with Ka Kamala, phony plus ineffective plus stupid, that is Kamala Harris. And this woman is vice president of the United States. God help us. How did this woman become vice president of the United States is a mystery to me. When, <laughs> when Trump, was, Trump was president, everybody was crying on national TV about kids in cages. Oh, my God, kids in cages. What are we going to do? Now that Biden is, is president, oh, everybody, it's so compassionate. We try to take care of these kids. Oh, then these holding facilities. Everything is so nice now. But Kamala, who is now deserved the border crisis, Oh my goodness gracious. I don't know when she'll ever get anything done. I hear she's going to the border now. I guess she'll wave her wand and all the puppies will, will wag a little faster and, <laughs> and, and the, bus, the sky will be blue and everything will be nice and wonderful. Hey, don't don't the forget the kitties purr louder. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. I forgot that one. My apologies. <laughs> so I, I was impressed mostly that... Uh, Lester Holt actually followed up with a hard question. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, mean, yes. I, I was watching that going, that's not an unreasonable question. He asked if you personally have been to the border. And then I thought, I'll be damned. This is the first time in, oh, I don't know, 30 years I've seen a reporter actually press a Democrat. Yes. <laughs> yes. Good point. Well, Good point. <laughs> well, I think that uh, that about puts a border around our show today. We've just about reached the end of the show. But uh, I'd like to thank our guests for joining us today. Uh, uh, Brian Brady, he is a realtor in California and founder of the Republican Liberty Caucus of San Diego. Uh, thanks so much, Brian. And uh, did you have any parting uh, thoughts or anything else you wanted to say uh, on the way out? Not at all. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Richard Bailey has an, an L that's missing in that website. Thanks so much for having me. And thank God you guys are doing this every week because uh, we sure need to have this this more because uh, Lester Holt can't hold it up for every one of us. <laughs>